Hello. Um, I have a feeling this is going to be a fairly small, intimate group. So, um, Peter, what yeah. college are you in? Uh, I'm I'm from Sandburg, Carl Sandburg College. Okay. And we just lost the other person. <laughs> I asked for an introduction and that was it. They were gone. Yes. They were shy. <laughs> um, yeah, I presented um, a preliminary time um, and at uh, the 2019. Um, and here's Matt. I'll bet I know which Matt it is. Um, so, um, and it was a fairly small room. Um, so we will, we will see. Wait a few minutes. Matt seems to be struggling. So Peter, while we're waiting just another minute or so for other people to come in, Hi, Matt. Is this Matt Lathrop or a different Matt? Uh, this is me. Ah, hey, Cindy. Me. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, Peter, I, I know Matt and Lori. They're both from my college. Um, what You said you were from Sandburg? Yep. And um, what interested you on this? Have you had... Um, blind students and I have never had any blind students, but I do teach developmental math. I have had one um, one of my colleagues um, when I taught at WIU did have a blind student, which ended up um, causing some issues actually because they weren't prepared for it. Um, in the end, it wasn't very successful. Well, we couldn't really measure any success with my friend because the blind student ended up dropping. So, um, but. Um, it's been brought to my attention a couple of times with um, our uh, at once um, to me as well, because I teach developmental math um, at Sandberg um, just as a, well, how, well, how do you, how would you approach it? Cause we use my math lab, things like that. And mm -hmm. um, I looked up a few things, but I know that my math lab, they've had their legal issues with um, d disabilities and stuff like that. And the, um, our, we changed our person who basically, ran the disability stuff for our school um this year too so the new person isn't as familiar with what our school even has so i want to just get a better idea of uh what i could do you know ideas of how how things could i could handle things in, in the event i do have some someone who's blind okay well yeah. welcome as um both Lori and matt know because they're from my college we currently have um well we have two i think right we have two blind students enrolled at the moment. Um, so, and I've had one in the past. I, that, that's the recent past. Uh, I had one or two longer ago. And my experience then was what you've experienced, Peter, was they didn't make it through the class. They dropped after the first three or four weeks. And um, so that was, that was a problem. So I'm gonna go ahead and start. Who knows if we'll get anybody else, hopefully but um, this will be recorded as well so people can do that. Um, I need to share my screen and I need, um, I need, I need my PowerPoint to come up. There we go. All right, so, um, well, we'll be a little less formal maybe than we might have otherwise since it's just us. Um, so, um, I entitled this The Tale of Two Students because I had one student before my sabbatical and one student after my sabbatical. And so um, that's kind of how it went. Um, so I, we've already kind of um, covered this. Um, Peter, especially, did you have any questions that you came here specifically wanting answers to? I may not have them, but. I'm just looking for basically info, just something in case that if I get a blind student, I can at least say, I have some ideas. <laughs> Great. And feel free to put my email down and contact me because this is something that I feel pretty passionate about. And I'd be glad to help you if, if I can. So, you know, um, and to review this for Lori and Matt, they probably have lost track of my life. Um, summer of 2018 
was kind of our chair at the time had been kind of after me to uh, go ahead and take a sabbatical. I had never taken one. I'm at year 21, so I was well past eligibility. And so he was kind of after it. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll do it on teaching um, math to visually impaired students. So summer 2018, I had decided to apply. I was kind of putting my decks in the row. I hadn't done anything about it. And August of 2018, I had Chris um, enroll in my college algebra class. So I met Chris, I believe I met Chris the week of class. I was informed maybe two or three days in advance that he was gonna be in my class. He was in college algebra and then he completed college algebra and he had finite math with me. During that time, I actually applied for sabbatical I was approved for sabbatical in 2019, but because of staffing issues, our chair asked me to put it off till the spring. And of course, by the spring of 2020, I was on sabbatical when all of you lovely people were dealing with COVID. So um, that's, that's how I spent my sabbatical, was hunkering down from COVID and working on this project. Um, from the summer semester 2020 through um, last spring, basically like everybody else, I was dealing with COVID. That was, I really didn't get anything further done after my sabbatical for a bit. But during that time frame, um, one of the things that I had strongly urged our um, associate dean to do was to purchase a printer for Braille. And um, the embossed printer, that's what it's for. And he did get two purchased, one for our department, it's in our building, and another for the student accommodation services. So we got those two. Um, fall of 2021, they had barely cracked those printers out of the box when I had my next fully blind student enrolled in our um, last dev ed class, the one that's going to for the non-STEM that's gonna survive all of the other interesting chaos that's going on in Illinois right now. So <clears throat> that's kind of the time frame. Pretty, pretty recent, all of it. And I thought I would just kind of go through um, it according to the timeline. So um, Chris was my first student. And when I was just envisioning that I was gonna do this, I had, as I say, one or two students in the past. It had never been a successful experience. Um, both, both of them had ended up dropping out prior to completing the course. Both of them withdrew before midterm. So, um, so Chris is there, and um, unlike the previous, well, like the previous two, Chris was partially sighted, but I'm um, legally blind. And it was a degenerative situation. So he had started as a completely sighted person and was gradually losing his eyesight with the prognosis that he would be completely blind before it was done. Um, he needed to have all the printouts enlarged and he had to hold them very close to his eyes to see them. So that was his um, situation. His strengths were that Chris was unbelievably determined. Um, and that's a common theme for my successful visually impaired students is the amount of determination they show is really very inspiring. He was very much a self-advocate, um, was very clear, this is what I need, and he was willing to work with you to get it, but he you know, was very upfront with what was gonna help him and what wasn't. He was quite tech savvy, so he could deal with new technology and it was not a problem. Um, as a matter of fact, as I will mention, he was ripping his talking calculator practically out of the container, the shipping container, um, 10 days into class. And we worked together to make, um, to make that work for him. He was very flexible. I could say, you know, this isn't working. Let's try this. And he was more than willing to try something new. And amazing memory skills. I would sit next to him and he would be doing 80, 90% of a problem in his head that I couldn't do that way, 
I'd be writing it out as he was going to keep track of things. And frankly, most of my colleagues probably wouldn't have been able to do those problems in their head. So that was a really big advantage he had was his memory skills. Um, and he was very strong on his math skills. He did not come in absolutely perfect, but I didn't have to tell him three or four times that no, you can't distribute exponents, okay? Um, he picked up very quickly and was able to... Um... Can, I, can I just add yes. something, Cindy? Sorry, yes, I don't want to interrupt you. But no, he, did, he did take uh, our developmental math first. Because, okay. Because he, yeah. he was a student and we used MyLabs Plus. But again, his eyesight wasn't as bad. We, I would uh, just enlarge like the notebooks and I think he went to uh, SAS, which is our disability services. And they had a reader that he could put the textbook in and it enlarged it. But anyway, so he, he did get a good um, background from our dev math. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Yes. Um, and... I don't know that his eyesight was um, deteriorating at a very fast pace, um, but yeah, I did it, uh, um, enlarge things and I believe maybe, um, well, I, I will get to it in just a second and you can see what I was providing for him. Um, the obstacles were that both college algebra and finite math are both very heavily visual. I would not necessarily have labeled finite as a very visual um, subject until I had Chris in my class um, because I thought, well, you know, we do a little bit of graphing, we graph a couple of systems, but that's it. Well, as we'll see, um, there were a number of things that were far more visually related than you might have thought of. He had never had a talking calculator before. He kind of pulled it out of the packaging virtually in front of me. And as I say, it came 10 days after he'd started my college algebra class. So um, he had never worked with it. Um, as a result, uh, within 24 or 36 hours of him getting it, he hit a wrong button and it stopped talking. And it was another 10 days before he and I managed to get it talking again. So essentially he went the first three weeks without his calculator. Um, so uh, one of the things I strongly urge after this is make sure you know the way around the talking calculator as well as your students. So if they do something, you can get them out of it. Um, he needed large en enlargements, but when we got to the graphing and to the matrices, he would tend to lose track of where things are because he couldn't see the whole thing at once. And I believe an example is here. So this is the eight and a half by 11 piece of paper I gave him. And those are two matrices that I used to, um, for him. So obviously I put the grid in there so he could keep straight where things were. Um, sorry, I lost this and I will go back. Um, um, so let me pull this back up. Hi, Natalie. Um, we're discussing a partially sighted student I had back in, um, uh, it was fall of 18, fall of 2018. So um, I enlarged it, okay? But he would go into the library and we had a camera that would project it onto a screen. And what Chris saw was this. That's how enlarged he would need it to really be able to read. So um, clearly one of the biggest issues he had was he never saw the entire matrix at once. He was having to keep a lot of it in, in his head. Um, so one of the things that I would do when I was working with him is I would repeat the entire matrix so he could locate where things were. Um, so that was the big challenge that we ran into for Chris was that um, he couldn't see an entire problem all at once. The other time that was a significant issue for it was when we were graphing. Graphing polynomials was no problem. Graphing lines he had in our dev ed courses, graphing um, parabolas he had a little bit in our dev ed courses, but all of the polynomials, cubics and rest, he was fine 
as long as the graph went from left to right without any gaps. When we got to rationals, having graphed one piece, needing to get the other piece in the correct location relative to it was very hard because it wasn't often that the scale was such that he could see both pieces at the same time. So those were the obstacles he ran into. Um, the lessons I came away from uh, working with Chris were that the talking calculator takes its own set of skills to use. Prior to Chris, I would have said, you know, hand him a talking calculator, life will be fine. Um, not really. <laughs> there are lots of things about a talking calculator that um, require getting used to, and your knowing your way around the calculator is really useful for the student. Um, if I had this again, even having had Chris in class before, I would probably say, is there any chance I could borrow it for 24 hours, you know, and get my hands on it and listen to it and work with it. Um, one of the things that was dead obvious that I did not catch on to originally is that when the graphing calculator is graphing, it plays a tone for where it's graphing in the plane. The higher the tone, the higher the number, lower the tone, the lower the number. So if you can track it, it will play kind of a little piece of music for where the graph is. But it was playing so fast that I couldn't tell. And so going back into the settings and creating a smaller step between X values would have slowed the, the graph down. So not only could I hear it, but so could have Chris heard it. So it would have been a lot more helpful if, um, if I had known that ahead of time. And there are other things um, about increasing volume in that that would be useful for you to know as an instructor. Um, be creative about how you create your handouts. Clearly, I do not generally give massive grids to my students from their matrices, but didn't take too long for me to go, well, Max, um, Chris is gonna need this because um, he can't. Otherwise, he has the leaning tower of, of columns and he's gonna be adding the wrong things and other such work. Um, for class management, I found that I had to really watch myself, otherwise I was teaching Chris and everybody else was just eavesdropping. Uh, so keeping the rest of the class's needs in focus while making sure that Chris could stay in, you know, in touch with what we were doing took a fair amount of practice, took some work. And all of it was only possible because I was spending time with Chris outside class. Um, we would take a brief break, 10, 15 minute break, and then I would meet him over in the student accommodations area. And we would spend about a, an hour after each class going through things, which um, because Chris was so determined and such a self-advocate, this was not an onus to me at all. Um, I was more than happy to do it and really enjoyed our conversations and our time. Um, but it's that kind of level that is probably going to need to be done by somebody, not necessarily me, as I will mention later. Um, so that was my experience with Chris. That was the spring, summer, let me get the right one, fall semester of 2018, spring semester of 2019. Um, I mentioned earlier that I was supposed to be on sabbatical fall of 2019, but because of staffing issues, our chair asked me to stay on and teach that semester. So I was off on sabbatical, the infamous spring 2020. And so this is what I was doing on sabbatical. So my project was to research the best practices for teaching math visually to impaired students. Um, and it took a little bit of a left turn. One of our colleagues on campus recommended, strongly urged me to um, go through the trusted tester certification that is for testing web pages and accessibility on the web. Then I used what I learned on that to review the different online homework systems we had that we were considering because during the same time, 
we were having to change out away from my labs plus to my labs math and we're considering going with other programs at the time um so that cut me through you know at least the first half of february and then late february through march through probably all of march um i was doing research on what I had said on different practices for teaching math. Um, and then over spring break, the state of Illinois closed. And so um, by about, about the beginning of April, I contacted my chair and suggested that I use the remaining time in the semester to create accessible online Calc 1 and Calc 2 classes. And that was approved. And so that's how I spent my sabbatical. Um, so allow me to, you know, go through these and uh, certainly I'll pause on each of these and see if anybody has questions about it. So trusted tester training. <clears throat> this is from what's termed 508 refresh. 504 and 508 were 1980s legislation from Congress that had to do with um, accessible web pages, well, accessibility of resources in education and business and the rest. But it, that original legislation was done in the 1980s before we really had much of the web. So in the mid to late 20 teens, they redid it and called it 508 Refresh. And it focused primarily on technology and the internet. Out of this came a training program from, of all places, Homeland Security. Um, and Homeland Security talked about um, <clears throat> how to ensure that the web pages were accessible. Um, and I did end up getting certified on this. But um, for the most part, this was for web designers. It wasn't necessarily for those of us lowly users. But I did get some. Um, some information out of it that I have used. First of all, your website needs to not have flashing or scrolling, certainly beyond a certain frequency because of neurological issues. But the user has to be able to turn it off if it's boring to um, bothering them. Um, decorative images like the smiley faces or you know a pie for pie day or whatever, those need to be labeled as decorative and not have alt text attached to it. Everything else that has meaning in your course must have alt text. And alt text is just a written description of what the image shows because that's what a screen reader will read out loud audibly for anybody who cannot see the image. The amusing part of all of this is you're supposed to describe the image in 120 characters, letters, spaces, numbers, or less. Well, I have yet to have posted anything on our Canvas site for classes that doesn't violate this. Every time I do the accessibility checker, it says, you've got too many characters. Well, what part of the equation should I not be telling the student? <laughs> so, it, because all equations are images. Um, equations, uh, graphs, anything that's not literally English is an image, and you have to have alt text on it. Um, so. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I just, you know, roll my eyes and move on because we can't do anything about the equation reads as the equation reads. You can't do anything about that. Um, when you're looking at um, websites, there needs to be a skip to main content on every page. This, frankly, is not something that's lacking um, hardly at all. I think back in 2020 when I was testing this, I might have run into a couple of pages that didn't have it, but generally it's always there now. Um, it just doesn't show. You have to be using the tab to um, navigate around the screen before it's going to show up where you can see it, but it's there. Uh, it sometimes shows and disappears almost immediately, but it's there. Um, that brings up that you have to be able to tab or shift tab to go backwards. Tab is forwards, shift tab is backwards. Or use arrows. 
uh, or the enter to access everything on the screen. This is sometimes a problem. Uh, sometimes you get stuck someplace if you can't use a mouse to get out of there. Um, sometimes it'll skip past things, but you're supposed to be able to access everything on the screen using tab, shift, tab, arrow, and enter. Or space, space bar as well. The location of the cursor needs to be easily visible. It can change color, it can underline. Um, uh, you need, you know, the cursor showing. Something needs to visually show uh, somebody where they are on the screen. That's for those who have hearing difficulties or who can't use a mouse and have to be using the keyboard. Answer blanks for our um, homework problems have to be labeled. They have to know what it is they're supposed to be answering. And sufficient contrast to the print in the background. I was going to show you briefly. Um, if I go back to my first slide here, this slide, the tale of two cities, this is questionable. I suspect it's just on the side of being okay, because this is reasonably bright. Any dimmer, and this would be considered inaccessible. So you really have to watch the contrast between the print and the background. And that usually only happens when you're trying to get fancy like I was with the, with the screen. Um, next one. And um, minimal use of outline, I'm uh, sorry, underlining, because screen readers will interpret underlining as if it's a hyperlink. So bold and italics is great. Change of color, as long as it's a big contrast. Um, and not relying on green and red, um, that sort of thing, but um, not, uh, not underlining because it will assume that it's a hyperlink sometimes. And videos must have closed captioning and transcripts. And it's the transcripts that is the bit of the um, unique part. Um, closed captioning, I think everybody knows about closed captioning. But transcripts, they need transcripts as well. Um, and it's very specific in the law, but one without the other is not sufficient. Um, so after I got through all of that and got my test and got my certification, um, I tested the online systems that we were considering at the time. And the upshot of all of that was that none of them were completely accessible. Uh, varying degrees of approximation, but obviously some were better than others, but none of them actually made it all the way. And the biggest issue, not surprisingly, is graphing. Um, there isn't anybody out there who knows how to make a graph accessible. It just, unless you can hand it to them physically in a 3D form, they're not accessible. So having gone through all that, then I started in on my research. Um, the best practices in teaching, what I had was say everything you write down for the people who can't see what you wrote and write everything you say for the people who can't hear what you so it said. Um, the one that always gets me is to slow down. You can tell I tend to be a motor mouth, but you need to slow down and, and speak clearly. Mistakes, which is my other poison, are deadly. You um, really have to work overtime to get over a mistake because, um, and for either visually impaired or hearing impaired students, they're going, basically they're toast, unless you make sure you go back and really get them started again correctly. Describe, describe, describe. Um, if you are dealing with a student who can't see the board or can't see the video presenter, you have to be describing it so that they can follow. Obviously that means graphs, you know, talking about increasing, decreasing, it's above the x-axis, it's below the x-axis. There's a maximum here, a minimum there, all of that, um, which lends itself to interesting assessment because in the process, you may very well have said what it is you're looking for, but um, you can't just assume that they're gonna know what you mean when you say over there. Um, but it also applies to equations. You need to be very careful about how you state equations. Um, 
the professor who was talking where I'm getting this and the device and method of communication um, said that when he was working with a blind student, he ran into the issue of he needed to communicate B to the A to the power BC plus D. And the problem was, by the way I said it, you probably assume that BC is in the exponent, but a student may not know that. So he would say B to the exponent, sorry, A to the exponent B times C back to base, meaning we're now out of the exponent again, plus your D. Or otherwise it would be A to the power B back to base times C plus D. So it was clear when the exponent was starting and stopping. Um, tops and bottoms of rational expressions the same way. I have, in my own um, text, have been a little more simplified. I'll say, so our numerator is, and you know, three X plus seven, and our denominator is two X minus five. Um, but you need to make sure that they know that the plus seven is still in the numerator, not down below or in the denominator or someplace else. So yes, you need to talk to your student one-on-one um, -on -one and just make sure they understand the language you're gonna use or adapt your, your language to something they may, uh, will understand. And obviously time outside of class, um, which as I was commenting is something that um, Chris and I found extremely useful. Um, the physical tools that, or physical and software tools that I found um, would be really useful. We have 3D printers in, in camp, on campus. I am um, was thinking about doing uh, some printing, 3D printing for next fall. It may turn out that I don't need to because I'm having to change my class a bit, but 3D printers for anything that you're going to use multiple times, 3D pens, tend to create something that's much more fragile. So you'll probably only be able to use it once or twice. Graphing boards are really, really um, important and um, very versatile. We have one from each of these. We have one from the American Publishing House. We also have one from Amazon. The Amazon one is a nice down and dirty, inexpensive, $12, bright yellow, because it was for um, K through 12. Actually, it was mostly primary school, but that's good because even people who are visually impaired frequently can see bright color. Um, so we've got a pegboard, rubber bands to create the graph. Um, the graphing board by the American Publishing House is a much more versatile, robust um, one. It's a cork board with grooves carved in it for the grid. Um, and so You've got a tactile image for the grid. You can place the X and Y axis anywhere you need to. They include wires for you to put on tacks so that there's a difference between the graph, which you do in rubber bands, and the, um, the axes for the um, wires. Um, and it's just very nice. Um, lines are obviously easy, but you can do curves by linking rubber bands together. So it's, it's a really nice, useful um, tool. An abacus um, is uh, really nice. The American Publishing House is the American Publishing House for the blind actually. And they have one with braille right on it. Amazon, you can get one that's fairly cheap. Um, it's really nice for um, a tactile learners period, not just people who uh, can't see. Braille printing, obviously, we have an embossed printer that um, we've gotten. And um, I wanted to mention Cadet, which is a um, closed captioning service. It was created by WGBH out of Boston. It's free and it's really nice in that it will keep where you're doing the closed captioning right alongside the video. Um, at least the old system we had, I would be scrolling and scrolling and scrolling because I would be way down on the transcript or on my closed captioning. And then I'd have to scroll all the way back up to get to the video and all the way back down to get where I was. And this is really nice because it goes um, side by side. 
And I believe I remember correctly that you can import documents to create the closed captioning with. So it's a really nice free program added there. Organizations that I you know, familiarized myself with, the National Foundation for the Blind is an, obviously a national um, organization, has loads of um, experts and loads of resources. Um, I sent them a text saying, this is what I'm looking at, what do you have? And they sent me <laughs> acres of stuff. Lighthouse for the Blind, um, there's a chapter up near Chicago. They also have some nice resources. And as we said, the um, American Publishing House, which um, just goes by American Publishing House, but the subscript is for the blind. Um, so that's where I got to with my sabbatical. And by that time, knew I was going to be teaching 100% online for the summer. So I asked and received permission to work on um, creating a Calculus One course and a Calculus Two course, which ideally would have been fully accessible. Um, so I started in with publishers, uh, published videos either in YouTube like Khan Academy or from the publisher. What I ran into was typically they did not describe the graph. So they put up a cubic and they'll say, so clearly we have a cubic and start talking about the cubic. Um, that doesn't help when the person can't see their graph. Um, and sooner or later, even the good ones assume the viewer sees the screen. And so it causes some problems. Um, but on the other hand, when I made my own, um, I stumbled along quite for quite a long time trying to um, get to a system. I recommend writing your script first if you can just follow it unlike I do most of the time. Um, you have your transcript built then. And um, for a lot of systems, uh, certainly for our old studio system, I haven't tried it with Yuja. Um, and for the cadet, you can then copy and paste into your closed captioning and you'll have it done. All that being said, when I'm at my most efficient, it takes me about two hours for a 15 to 20 minute video. So, um, and I was doing calculus one week one, calculus two week one, calculus one week two, calculus two week two. Trying, I had gotten up to about week three by the end of the spring semester and was in complete panic mode when um, our chair just said, well, you know, you don't have a visually impaired student in your classes, you could just give up. <laughs> yes, which I did, which I did. Um, so I do recommend um, I try to do this myself. Do the new videos I create, make sure that they are actually accessible, have the transcript, have the um, closed captioning. Um, and then I, you know, eventually I will get back to revising the others so they um, work. So from summer 2020 to spring, a year ago last spring, I think all of us were in survival mode. We barely just got by. Um, in that time frame, the college did purchase two embossed printers. Um, and like, did I mention I was in survival mode? I didn't even put my hands on them um, for that entire time. Late July, early August, it might have been about August 1st, our chair contacted me and let me know that there was going to be a blind student taking our class math literacy class, which is the lead in the DevEd course that is a precursor to um, our statistics course or our uh, general mathematics course. And he asked me, would I be willing to be a support person or would I be willing to take the class? I said I would do either. And our adjunct, John, because he is an adjunct, very wisely said, I'm out of here. And I took the class. So that was my second student, and my second student was Wilma. So here's Wilma. Wilma, as opposed to um, Chris, Wilma is totally blind. That's her, her seeing eye dog Tucker there with her. Um, she had 
the same or a related thing. I don't know it was the same disease at all, but she was fully sighted at one time. She lost her sight due to a degenerate illness um, of some sort, genetic or otherwise. She has minimal light and dark um, vision, but not enough for her really to navigate even. So it's, it's very, very small. And of course she has Tucker. Um, some of the non-math things that I have learned that are kind of a well duh, but you need to be have them in your mind when you're dealing with these, is always tell her who's walking up next to her. Hi, it's Cindy. How are you doing today? So she knows who she's talking to. Um, and sometimes I have to say, hi, it's Cindy, math teacher. Because <laughs> maybe she knows more than one Cindy. I don't know. Um, and describe what you're doing. You know, I'm handing you, you know, these sheets now. So that you know, she she knows what's going on. Like Chris, she has an amazing amount of determination. She has very clear goals. She wants to work in the public schools to help students who are blind. Um, so that helps with her determination and her perseverance. She reads Braille, which you cannot count on with blind students, and she even reads Nemeth code which is the braille that mathematicians and scientists use who cannot see. So that's excellent. Unfortunately, our um, embossed printer does not print mammoth code. So that's another issue. Um, you need both. You need the person to read it and you need the wherewithal to do it. But um, you live with what you have. So she has an amazing work ethic. I can't believe the amount of um, time she works on. So she only has one class and that helps her. She is in class four hours a week and she has tutoring for an additional hour and a half after class each day. They take a brief break for lunch and then keep going. So she is working five and a half hours on Monday and Wednesday every week for class. Then on Thursday and or Friday, don't know exactly how it goes. She has an additional four hours of tutoring with a second tutor by phone. And beyond that, she is working on her own. So um, that is probably works out to the amount of work we claim students ought to do, but it's far more uh, work than most of my students do and far more difficult than most of my students have to work. Um, her obstacles, really complete blindness. There's no handouts. Well, I, I give her braille handouts. She can't read anything. Our lovely lady Wilma is in her 70s. And um, some 70 year olds are probably very good with tech. Unfortunately, Wilma is not. Um, she struggles with using Canvas. She struggles with using Alex. In fact, um, this is the last bit that she needs to have before she leaves Heartland to move on to other things. Um, and so she has not used Canvas for any of her classes. She doesn't actually use Canvas for my class because it's just too hard to navigate. Um, she struggles with Alex and um, has difficulty navigating through it. I'll mention in a bit about some of the issues we had with it. Um, she kept saying, no, she didn't need a textbook way last summer when I first met her, um, told our accommodations office that she didn't need it, told me she didn't need it about halfway through the class period, through the class about midterm last fall. I went, yeah, you really do need it. Well, and she goes, well, that would be nice. Um, so I contacted our assessment and accommodations, um, access and accommodations office. And they said, well, that's all well and good. It's going to take us about six months to get it, six to nine months. And when she researched it, she came back with, well, not only is it going to take nine months to get it, it's $190,000 for one copy. Um, I about swallowed my tongue when I heard that. So, um, yeah, it's you kind of assume you're not going to have a textbook for these students. Um, and yes, the college bought an embossed printer, but I did not have full access to it until about week 10 of the fall semester. 
The upshot was that Wilma couldn't survive, of course, for the fall. Um, about week 10, I recommended to her that she um, audit the remainder of the class. That's not abiding by our college's policy. You really can't go to a, from a grade class to an audit class, but um, our dean agreed that we had not provided her everything she needed. So he allowed us to do that. So then Wilma um, re-signed on to the same class and I was also grateful that she was willing to do that. And um, so we still don't have a textbook. Um, Alex, what we've come to is that her tutor, Stacy, reads the problem to her. Uh, Wilma does the problem and then Stacy records the problem, it puts it into the system. That's how we've managed to make it work for her. Um, Alex does read only if you are in <laughs> Firefox, which was the big struggle we had in the fall. Um, Canvas really only works with Chrome and Alex really only works with Firefox. We couldn't get the two together. So I gave up on Canvas. It's loaded onto a computer in Alex, and now everything will actually read the pro English and the problem both at the same time. Wonderful. Um, and about week 10, week 11, we finally had, I finally had full access to the printer and could start um, giving her brilled copies, which I am now doing. Um, the lessons I've learned, get ahead of the curve. I really thought I was ahead of the curve when I started this with Wilma. I had spent 16 weeks trying to figure out what I would needed to do. We had the embossed printer. We um, really, I had the graph boards. I had, you know, she had a graph uh, talking calculator. I thought we were going to be okay. And then we just kept hitting obstacles. Um, the amusement part, amusing part on Alex was before we were in um, in Firefox. And the problem is that the Canvas doesn't work in Firefox. That's why we didn't just switch. But before we were in Firefox, uh, <laughs> JAWS, the common screen reader, would read all the uh, math. And the internal reader that they would have would read all of the, the English. But of course, never the twin would meet. Um, so you need to make sure that you know what browser you have to have, um, <laughs> be able to get it working, uh, make sure that you have access or your accommodations office has access to the embossed printer. We ran into problems of um, licensing and all the rest. Um, there's still an issue with the embossed printer. It will not print Nemeth code. And math type, which is a wonderful outfit. How did we ever survive without math type? It um, creates Nemeth code, which it ought to, because that's what all the mathematicians and scientists do. But our printer just ignores it all and refuses to print any of it. So I end up having to go in to my handouts and if they're in math type, which they typically are for the, my other students, retype it in all in a line, all in Word, so that I can adequately braille it. Um, I did eventually get all of the things there. When I create a, a, a braille copy for her, I put spaces between every line. Um, and as I say, get all of the math written in Word, not in math type. So that's kind of a long, praying, um, but I am willing and ready for any questions or comments that people would like to have. I think that's it. There's my email, especially Peter, if you, <laughs> you're the only one who doesn't have it. So if you would like it, please copy it down and I'll be glad to converse more with you. Um, any, uh, any questions or comments? Don't everybody talk at once. This is what happened when I was online with my classes. <laughs> well, Cindy, I can just say that you have been um, an amazing resource for, uh, for the math department here at Heartland because you have done so much work 
on this. And I appreciate your sharing this with other people too, because it's just a daunting task. <laughs> so we really do yeah, thank appreciate you. all that you've done for our students. Yeah, I, I think I'm not the most popular person in a few quarters, but <laughs> sometimes it takes rattling some cages to get somewhere. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing this presentation too. Um, yeah, I don't usually, it, it amazes me that they're, they talk a lot. We hear a lot about disabilities, but blindness and dealing with bl uh, blindness and math is not discussed that much. So I, I really appreciate all your work. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things that I will kind of open up for questions since we have a few minutes, um, I, hope, I don't know if anybody else has a better answer for this than I've been able to find. Um, the big issue is still graphing. Nobody has solved that puzzle. Nobody knows how to graph. Um, with a graphing calculator, now that I know it, you slow the steps down and you'll get tones, but that mm. is only partially good. So what, why do we graph? What do we learn from graphs? What do we need our students to do with graphs? Well, I, with graphing for me, I always, this is what I tell students too. Um, the reason we need, well, the reason I feel we need them is because that um, we need to be able to analyze them. Uh, if you look at, you know, all the various news articles and things we read, you, um, there's all sorts of always some sort of study or something that says this is going up or this is going down. or Here's how something's working. And they usually have graphs to support it. So, but um, for blind people, I don't know how they would read those anyway. So I'm not really sure if it would apply, uh, how it would apply in that um, regard there. Um, the other thing I think about is in terms of analysis, understanding what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it does allow us to summarize better than when we're looking at data. The data tends to you know, become just a mass of numbers. But um, yeah, the problem is that all of our algebra classes and most of our non-algebra classes require graphing or reading graphs or both. And if we could manage to define more specifically what it is we're trying to get out of the graph, what it is we're trying to communicate by the graph, we might be able to find better ways to express this to people who can't see them. Um, and in the process, maybe be able to teach them better. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I've, I still struggle. And the first time I brought this up was, uh, I think it was 20, 2018, maybe 2018, when I was at an AMATIC conference and I just kind of made a straw poll of people I talked to and why do we graph? And they just basically looked at me blankly. You know, what was going in their head, I'm sure was, are you crazy? Of course we graph. What are you asking this for? Um, but I, you know, feel a little bit like the two-year-old who keeps asking why and um, not getting an answer. <laughs> um, well, so well, I, I, I know why we graph because for sighted people, it is much easier. A visual picture is so much easier to read than just reading lines of data. For a blind person, it's not easier, but for sighted people, mm -hmm. you, can, you can look at a huge chunk of data in a very quick visual. And see, hey. and see trends. Yeah. Cindy, yeah. have you found, so I feel like this would be related and kind of like what Lori is saying, how for a sighted person, it's easier to look at a graph and, and see what's happening. Do sign charts, have you tried to use sign charts with students who are blind or have, like, does that help them or is that as confusing as a graph? Um, I can't say I've tried it. Okay. Wilma, of course, is in our dev ed. So level, that's not really. Uh, so, you know, Peter. Uh, so it, she's not struggling with this. And Chris, again, had had some sight. So it was a little better. I was um, intrigued. I think I would say 
that Chris did really well in college algebra with graphing until we hit rationals. And yeah. then it wasn't connected. Right. So he had a really hard time. He could do the first piece, but then he got to the second piece and didn't know how to, um, you know. Position. What, position it, thank you. Position <laughs> it relative to the first piece. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was kind of where I was starting with. So why are we doing this? And it helps me, but even I can't give you a good explanation for what it is about a graph that is gives us so much more information than the equation or a list of points does. Well, one thing um, when you're think when you're mentioning too about um, you know thinking about the graphs and what information we can get, one thing that has come to mind teaching developmental math anyway. Um, there are times where certain types of graphs are thrown in that I know for uh, for uh, pretty much a fact that my students who are non, especially non-STEM, are never going to see again in their lives. Um, and there are times I really think that we need to think about, okay, yes, we do want to teach graphing for the reasons that have been described about the data and reading, um, reading things in their lives, that stuff. But um, sometimes I think we need to think about which which graphs do we need, you know, to have all these different polynomial graphs? Do we need to have the absolute value graphs um, or, or is just, you know, linear graphs, maybe some par par parabolic graphs enough? Um, just that sort of stuff too, I think needs to be uh, looked at on occasion because um, yeah, even, even the sighted students um, that's, um, with developmental math, even the science students, that can, graphing can be an issue. Uh, I've had some, some students who they will do okay, and then they just get to graphing and just freeze. And it's just you know, you try ha you have to really work with them to actually get them to move forward with that. Yeah, well, I think I mentioned Chris was was a wonder. Um, lines, parabolas, cubics, all of those, he was just fine. Then we hit vertical asymptotes on rational graphs. And I don't know that he ever did. He might have been able to figure out what we were talking about again, because Chris and Wilma both have the advantage that they do have some memory of being able to see things. Um, but he could not himself um, align things. And um, it, it came up to be even more a problem when it, we came to matrices because he had a real trouble keeping the different cells of the matrix in the correct relative positions because he couldn't see the whole matrix at once. Mm -hmm. So back to your question about why we, I don't know this is really an answer, but I was thinking about mathematical modeling and if you are in a if you're in a problem where you're trying to decide the appropriate model for your data, having an understanding of the end behavior of your polynomial, you know, should it turn down again? Should it continue mm -hmm. increasing? But I guess you don't really have to demonstrate that visually. Mm -hmm. um, it brings to mind something that I. I was really could have kicked myself for because it took me months to work this out. So Chris was just pulling this um, talking calculator out and it would play a tone when he was graphing. It took me the longest time to figure out that the tone it was playing was representing the value of Y. When the tone went up, Y went up. When the tone went down, Y went down. Um, and it was like, well, duh. But the problem was that this the um, default speed at which the calculator graphs was too fast for my ear to catch what was going on. So now I know if I ever have a student like Chris again who needs college algebra, now I know we need to go into the calculator and change the step at which the calculator is graphing so that, um, so it slows down and you can actually follow what it's doing. 
Um, yeah, we are at four o'clock. So thank you so much for coming, Peter. Thank you for coming, Lori. Well, thank, thank you um, for doing this. I had to leave. So um, have a really good evening and weekend. And uh, hope we uh, see you again. Like I say, Peter, if you do run into anything you want um, to know, my sources or anything, feel free to, to send me an email. Well, thank you. And thanks again for doing this. Oh, you're very welcome.